Okay, this is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a given Wednesday afternoon, and we have our chief scientist uh, on the show. It's Mike DeWert, and we're talking about technology, Think Tech Tech Talks. Hi, Mike. Welcome to the show. Aloha, Jay. Good to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, it's nice to have you here because we, we, have, we have some work to do. We have to try to figure out what to tell the people about the, uh, the factors of expansion of the virus. That's what it's all about. Uh, we yeah. need to know where this is all going and we have to get a good handle on it. And, and frankly, I don't think we're getting much of a handle from our leadership. Uh, so mm. we need you to help us understand what kind of uh, algorithms we should use and, and what kind of numbers they produce in terms of uh, what's going to happen with the spread of this virus. So tell me what you have been doing to, you know, to identify the algorithms and the numbers. Well, I, I do a lot of, me I've done medical research, but I'm not EPD epidemiologist. So let me preface it that I'm not a professional epidemiologist, but Last February, uh, end of February, I started to get concerned when I saw the cases in China and how they were doubling every four days and uh, how it had started to spread to the rest of the world. Um, so I, I read some numbers. Um, China had started to get a handle on their epidemic, but I assumed that the rest of the world wouldn't get a handle on it. And um, so if you bring up slide two in my presentation, you'll see what I predicted back in, back in February. So I, in February 26, which is where this orange vertical line is, there's a, I made a prediction, which is this curve, this gray curve you see. The uh, little uh, orange dots on the curve are data so far from the website um, uh, healthmaps.org COVID-19, which is pretty up to date. Uh, they, they, several times a day, they're a consortium of several universities and hospitals, international, trying to keep us abreast of the best information. And scarily to me, the predictions in February uh, that the rest of the world would do nothing effective and that the cases start to double every four days and the rest of the world are true, uh, which means that every, every two weeks, this is going to get 10 times worse. So if we have 100 cases in Hawaii today, we'll have uh, 100 times as many and 10 times as many in two weeks. Um, and if you have a one in 10,000 chance today of meeting somebody with a virus, you have a one in 1,000 chance in two weeks and a one in 100 chance two weeks after that, one in 10 chance after that, it just gets really bad. And they so talk what about factors how, do you build in? What, what factors, sorry, finish and I'll ask you my question. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, Jay. <clears throat> what, what, what do you build in, uh, like for example, the benefit of containment, benefit of uh, social distancing, you build in masks and, and gowns and gloves, so you build in all these things people want to try uh, to ameliorate the, the odds? Um, well, so, so what we have is a naive population, immunologically naive, that has never been exposed to this virus before. So everyone is susceptible. Everyone pretty much is susceptible all over the world, no matter you know, what your race and ethnicity, whatever it is. Um, uh, there's nobody who, there's no herd immunity. There's, a, we've never been exposed to this before. We don't have a vaccine for it. So all you can do is slow it down. The ultimate number of victims is going to be what it is, um, which is probably, Germany is estimating 60 to 70% of the population. Um, I went conservative and estimated 100% um, will be exposed and actually catch the virus. If we go to, I did do some predictions for Hawaii. If we go to slide three, I think it is. Um, oh, yeah, this is my source for the data for Hawaii in the United States. I did a Bean search, and Bean will give you the provenance of their data at the bottom. So, but the first thing that shows up there is how many cases in Hawaii, how many cases in the United States, how many cases worldwide. Uh, this is pretty consistent worldwide with what healthmaps.org gives. And I just take a snapshot at nine o'clock every day to you know, just see how it's going. Then on the fourth slide, I put up the numbers, what I expect for Hawaii. So the uh, gray curve is the world. The uh, yellow curve is the United States. It's, a, it's the same scale as the world, but Hawaii is on the right scale. We have a little over a million people, 1.3, 1.4 million or so. And that black curve shows what I expect for Hawaii. To the left is cases to date. So to the left of the blue curve is the cases to date, and the United States and Hawaii are both increasing faster than the world average. The doublings in the United States are like every three days. 
which is intolerable. I mean, we're going to hit a crisis in a few weeks that way. Um, I'm assuming that both Hawaii and the United States will slow down to doubling every four days like the rest of the world. Um, and that's not good enough. So if we go to uh, the slide after that, um, let's see. Oh yeah, so, and the reason that's not good enough, even if we slow down to every four days, in about a month, we're gonna have 11,000 cases in Hawaii according to this projection. And we only have like 550 ventilators in the whole state. So 5% of the people who get sick need to be on ventilators. We are out of ventilators in a month. Um, that's when the real difficulty will be with the healthcare system. You'll be denying care to a lot of other people because the hospital will be full of very, very sick COVID-19 patients. Um, so what can we do to flatten the curve? Well, I'll show you what flattening the curve means. Go to the next slide after that one. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Here's, here's, I, here's my, I already mentioned these numbers, but we have, like I say, uh, today we have one in 10,000 viruses, uh, 1, 000, 1, 000 people have the virus in Hawaii. I ran to a guy last night said, at the grocery store said, why is everybody worried? Yeah, okay, when you have only one in 10,000 chance of being exposed, sure, you're not worried. But in two weeks, it's one in a thousand. Uh, by end of April, we're going to be a thousand people dead of the virus and, um, you know, close to a hundred thousand people infected. And we're going to say, well, why the heck didn't we do anything? And so we'll see what we can do. The slide after that shows what we might be able to do. So uh -huh. the red curve is what they call the curve of new cases versus time. When they talk about flattening the curve, that's what they're really? talking about. The red curve is just the slope of the cumulative data I showed earlier. And mm -hmm. that red curve is showing if we don't get a handle on slowing this four, doubling every four days uh, case down, we're going to hit almost 60,000 new cases a day per day in Hawaii by the end of May. It'll fall after that just because the virus will run out of victims. But we, we simply can't handle 60,000 sick people a day in Hawaii. Uh, we, we can't even handle 1,000 new, new cases a day uh, with the situation now. If we slow it down to every eight days, we delay the peak until July. So we buy ourselves six weeks or so to come up with an effective treatment that, so we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. If we can slow the um, rate of doubling down to every 12 days, we buy ourselves until early September probably. Um, we're still not talking enough time for a vaccine. So, so on the next slide, I sort of summarize the situation. Uh, we can buy ourselves some time. The uh, vaccine won't be ready in time for this epidemic. It takes at least a year, maybe a year and a half to be sure it's safe, effective, and can be produced. Um, I've heard people blithely speak of herd immunity, but for herd immunity to be effective, you have to have a vaccine or you have to have everybody already caught the disease. <laughs> Most people have to have the disease or have been exposed to it and overcome it for there to be any herd immunity. So when you hear people talk about herd immunity, it'll save us, no, it won't. Um, we can hope for better treatments. And there's a lot of people working on better treatments that can soften the impact of the disease. So you don't have to put sick people on ventilators so that you can keep them home, uh, reduce the rate at which they expose other people. Um, that's what we have to hope for. Um, it still will take weeks to months to validate that those are safe. Um, I used to take quinine for leg cramps. Uh, FDA, that was 30 years ago, FDA said don't do that because the uh, side effects are worse than the disease. Um, so there's a problem. If you really want to stop the spread of the disease, you have to medicate everybody who has it. And that medication has to be safe. You know, quinine can cause liver damage, kidney damage, eye damage hearing loss, um, the list of side effects goes on in therapeutic doses. So we do need better treatments. So we've got to give the healthcare people time. And the only way to do that is for us to pretty much slow the transmission from person to person by staying home. Wash your hands, don't touch your face, all the standard advice. But uh, that will buy us time. It will not slow, it probably will not reduce the ultimate number of cases. It will delay the maximum number of cases people are infected, maybe enough for the healthcare system to you know, allow us to treat everybody who gets sick. Um, but that's, uh, we, we just gotta have the self-discipline and, self and the compassion for each other to stay home and uh, reduce the transmission rate. 
<laughs> and the economy has got to have enough strength somehow to uh, al allow us all to stay home. But uh, let me let me go yeah. back a little bit. We're the richest country in the world. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Used to be. <laughs> so uh, yeah. the, 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 these charts are fairly alarming. Um, yeah. And that's why you're not and, standing. And, and, the, uh, yeah. Sorry. And, and, what, and what's interesting was what you just said is that you can flatten the curve, but at the end of the day, you're still going to have the same number of cases uh, unless there can be, uh, you know, a vaccine before you make this analysis. The same number of cases and the same number of deaths, whether you have a sharp uh, uptake or uh, you flatten the, the curve. Is that right? It'll, it'll be fewer deaths because you'll lower the rate at which the um, cases come into the healthcare system. That gives the doctors a better chance to, in their triage, to save some people they wouldn't have been able to save otherwise. And the other thing is, if you overwhelm the healthcare system, you end up reducing transplant patients, you end up reducing cardiac patients' care, you end up reducing care for all kinds of other diseases, infectious diseases, as well as kidney failure from diabetes. So you and get all more that. deaths. Yeah. You'll get even more deaths if you don't slow this down because we'll overwhelm the healthcare system with COVID-19 cases and everyone else will be denied care and you'll, the carnage will be. Right now, we're, if it was just COVID-19, we'd face a doubling of our death rate for a year. Um, with COVID-19 plus the overwhelm of the healthcare system, we could triple the death rate, um, which, you know, that it's... You can blithely say if it was war, we would accept those casualties. This isn't a war. We're a civilian population. We can't ask uh, everybody, granny, grandpa, uh, the people with asthma, to take those casualties. Um, it'll be the most vulnerable people to take most of the casualties. And so we've, we've just got to slow this down, give the healthcare system a chance to save the sickest people and to be able to treat everyone who has other things besides COVID-19. Okay, many questions. Let me go back to the doubling oh. effect. Uh, so you made a survey using Bing and, uh, and, and then you, you had some some statement of authority on the charts you used. But, right. you know, uh, that, and that's different from what we've heard. I mean, we, or at least what some people have heard. Uh, I, have, I have heard these numbers before. But how authoritative mm -hmm. is this? I mean, how... How, and fundamentally, how do you make this calculation of, of doubling? Right. You look at the cases. I looked at the cases in China before they implemented their controls. Uh -huh. Their reported cases doubled every four days. And that's cumulative cases, not people who are necessarily new cases. But that's an exponential growth. And they'll talk about how it's a logistic function and an exponential function. But the difference between a logistic function and exponential function is insignificant until about one third of the at-risk population is infected. Um, and the ultimate authority are the data. Go look at chart two again, and you'll see how the data are tracking the prediction. Uh, but, yeah. So okay. those, those little orange boxes, that's the data from February 20, well, for the epidemic so far worldwide. Um, I made this prediction, the gray curve on February 26th, and the data are sadly tracking it for a month. The data are tracking it, and now we're on it. The, the orange boxes are part of the, the orange boxes was your prediction, and then the no, line no, the right gray, next to the orange. The gray line was my prediction. The orange boxes are real data. Okay, got it, got real it. So data. here we are, real, and if right. the if the orange boxes keep on following your prediction, uh, we'll be at a million a million cases worldwide by what? Can we see that one more time? Uh, I think that's <clears throat> by by June sixth. Hmm. No, we'll have a million cases by uh, by by first of April. It's going to double. So it's right now worldwide. We're at something like uh, almost over half a million cases. If it doubles um, again, we'll be there. So in four days, we're going to be there at a million cases worldwide. Now a million out of seven and a half billion is saying, nah, it's only less than one in a thousand. But the point is, it'll keep doubling, especially again to vulnerable populations in India, uh, the refugee populations in Syria, all the displaced people from Argent, from um, Venezuela, and some of the other places where we have refugees. Yeah. Um, is and then those cases. If you don't protect everybody, if you don't try to give everybody health care, nobody's safe from this, because this virus will spread in the vulnerable populations and inevitably jump to the uh, less vulnerable populations. 
So. Oh, so going back to that chart again. So if I look further <clears throat> to, to see what the numbers were, say at the end of the, the timeline, which is June, June 6th, what, what, what yeah. does that actually work out to? That's the world population. <laughs> yeah. I made a very, very pessimistic assumption that China's controls would cease to be effective once they start getting reinfected from outside China. And so that everybody- Oh, in the world sorry, I, yeah, I misread it. That's a billion, more than a billion. Yeah. Yeah, that that that, 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 curve, that that chart tops out at seven and a half billion people sometime in June. Um, that's assuming everybody uh, is susceptible, and uh, the controls cease in China cease to be effective. Um, and, and of course, the United States is poised to become the biggest caseload in the world. You know, sometime in the next few days, we're going to overtake Italy. But then once Can India you say starts. Why? Because we have a fragmented, disjointed healthcare system that has not been able to do contact tracing and uh, really um, quarantine people who have been exposed to the virus. What I understand, from my understanding, what's been successful in Korea and Taiwan and Singapore is that really diligent contact tracing. Somebody comes down to the disease, gets diagnosed with the disease. You, they have volunteers who will go out, unemployed volunteers, mind you, because they've locked down their economies, who will go out and do the contact tracing make sure those contacts get tested and then quarantined um, as, as needed. And that really slows it down. We do not, you know, the governor of New York's already said he can't do contact tracing. There's just not, there's too many cases already. They don't have the resources. And we have a chance in Hawaii to do that. We got to jump on it. We got to really um, start testing as much as we can, not just the really sick people, but people who have been exposed so that you can slow this transmission curve um, we're, uh, I, I don't want to be right. I don't want to be right that we're going to have billions of cases of this disease in, a, in six weeks. Because if we do, uh, if we think the world economy is hurting now, it's it'll be really it'll be a depression. It'll be really much much worse if we let this happen. We can take a hit for a while, uh, but we got to we got to give the doctors time to get treatments, you know, effective treatments out there. Um, safe and effective well, treatments. Great, great concern for Hawaii uh, because it falls right. Can we see the numbers on Hawaii one more time? What chart was that? Yeah, uh, four. Yeah, the, so the black okay. curve is my prediction for Hawaii. So to the left of the blue line, the vertical dotted blue line, all that is mm -hmm. real data, the real data. Um, mm -hmm. And Hawaii has been doubling every three days. I don't think that will continue. I think that our quarantine and measures are shut the state down measures will be pretty effective but i'm only assuming it's going to slow it down to once every doubling every four days i have very little confidence that the u.s as a whole will slow down but it might slow down to once every, but even if we slow down to once every four days like the rest of the world we're we're we exposed everybody in hawaii by middle of may I and mean, we're facing a catastrophe so we have to hope we can slow it down to way slow it down. Like every eight days might not be enough because it only gives us till July or so. And, and, and the problem with slowing it down, so when you slow the exponential growth rate down, it seems like nothing much is happening. People get complacent because there aren't very many cases, but that exponential inevitably starts to build cases and then you're back in a crisis. Um, we have to stay vigilant even if we do slow down the caseload because um, unless we uh, do that, we, we run the risk of, of, of having the exponential take a hold again. So even if we slow it down to every eight days doubling, we're still facing 30 or 40,000 cases a day in July. And if we slow it down to every 12 days, we're still looking at 20,000 cases a day in September. It'll be nothing in May, apparently, It'll be very low, but it will, you know, the, the math just it leads to the inevitable conclusion that it's going to get very, very bad eventually. Um, that, that's eventually in Hawaii. Become, that's it's in, in Hawaii. Hawaii. That's in, yeah. That's pretty yeah. scary. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, it's sobering. It's sobering to actually do the, be able to do the math and see the consequences of inaction. Um, and then the, even the consequences of action are scary. Even if we can slow this down, we still look into scary caseloads. And we have to then buy our, we're hoping that we're buying time for the medical community, the research community, 
to come up with, a, I can say, safe and effective treatments. I don't think we'll buy enough time for a vaccine. Well, and I, um, going back to the, the notion of, um, of uh, testing, you know, that, that's been in some discussion between David Ige and Bruce Anderson, Director of Health, and, mm -hmm. um, and also Josh Green about how important yeah. that is. Uh, but by itself, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do with testing? I mean, everybody says you in order right. to figure out what mm -hmm. to do, you have to know where you are, you have to know mm -hmm. how many people have it. How does that work right. uh, on a, a mathematical basis? Well, what you it, testing alone will do a lot. You've got to have testing coupled with effective treatment and contact tracing. I mean, in, in of course, China is an authoritarian state, but in democracies like Korea and Singapore, um, you know, Korea and Taiwan, they've been able to actually have volunteers go through and do the contact tracing. So if you somebody tests positive for the disease, you ask them to self-quarantine and then you find their contacts and get them to self-quarantine. And you have to have policies in place where people aren't going to be, medical bills aren't going to kill them if they get a, a diagnosis of this disease. They have to be not afraid to get tested. Because um, right now, of course, you can refuse any treatment um, you, you're allowed to refuse any medical treatment, including a medical test. People have to not be afraid to be tested. They're not afraid of financial ruin from their medical bills for testing. Um, this stimulus bill, this rescue bill that the Congress and Senate and the President look like they're going to actually finally get done will help with that. Um, it, but here in Hawaii, we actually have to somehow have boots on the ground, volunteers, whoever, to help people make sure a if they get tested that they can tra you can trace their contacts and inform everybody they've been in contact with that they need to get tested and then you got to really convince people to still self, self quarantine when that test proves positive and that's mm -hmm. so testing alone is not enough you got to do testing plus contact tracing plus self quarantine and uh, then we have a chance of slowing this down uh, and I, i've been impressed well, with josh green statements on this to this effect mm -hmm. good yeah. um so let's talk about the average Joe. Let's talk about me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've been, you know, uh, I've been good, been following the rules for the most part. And, right. and you too, you're, you know, on the show by remote, yeah. and so am I. Um, and so I think, well, maybe if I do the right things, this, I, this is, I hate this question, and I know I'm going to hate your answer. Mm -hmm. If I do the right things, I won't get it. Uh, and I'm not sure why I feel that way. I just feel that if you follow the rules, then you should escape the, the problem. I, is it true what I've said? Can, can I engineer this personally so I simply don't get it? Um, you could greatly reduce the probability you'll get it soon. Um, it's like... <laughs> That's pretty... <laughs> I'm not uh, I'm encouraged. Sorry. I, 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 I want, I want, I want, I don't want to give you false hope. Um, it's, it's like the seasonal cold. You know, everybody gets a cold in the winter and you expect to get a cold in the winter. For most people, it's nothing. This disease is, you know, orders of magnitude more serious than a cold, but it's not Ebola. It's, um, you have a 1% chance of dying if you get it. And that's if you're vulnerable. And so, so what you want to do is you want to reduce your chances of getting it so that you have as long as possible before you are likely to get it. And then you have a better chance that there will be an effective treatment or that the hospitals won't be overwhelmed and you do need to go. Um, and it's you reduce your chance that you'll need it. Yeah, you're, you're buying yourself time to have access to the effective treatments. Um, I, and like I say, I expect I'll get cold this winter uh, now I expect I'll eventually get COVID-19. Um, I wash my hands, try not to touch my face. That's the hard part, not touching your face. I don't have to work at home because I'm in the defense industry and I'm allowed to go to work, but we are working from home. Every one of us who can work from home is working from home because uh, it's important to slow this down enough. Um, so, and we got to slow it down a lot. Um, you said the one percent fatality, but uh, if you're vulnerable, but is, isn't it that if you are vulnerable out of the sample, it's more than one percent? In other words, if it I'm is more. Old, weak, and immune compromised, it's like like fifteen percent or so. Yeah, that's that's right. Then it's less than one percent if you're in your twenties, but you're still not immune from dying even if you're in your twenties. 
So on average, yeah. it looks like around 1% on average. Um, it, it could be, you know, some reports say as high as 3%. I don't think that's true. I think the cases have been underreported. And we're seeing that report now that um, uh, it looks like the, on average for the whole population, it's around 1%, which still makes it way worse than the seasonal flu and even worse than the uh, H1N1 swine flu that was in the 2008, maybe on a par with the 1918 uh, flu epidemic that killed so many people, killed more people than World War I did. So, oh, so we are so facing war Let's talk about self-help and <clears throat> see if that fits in the picture and improve the odds, <laughs> yeah. which are really yeah. dreadful. Um, right. So, uh, I mean, there's no masks around, it's hard to get them. There's right. no tests around, right. hard to get them. Um, I suppose uh, in, in lieu of tests, you want to watch yourself very carefully. You want to watch for the telltale symptoms, and right. that's about all you right. can do with that. On masks, we have a show later today about a guy who's making masks on the Big Island. That's good. Uh, he, mm -hmm. He's fabricating masks. It's the best he can, and <clears throat> he's creative, and he has this kind of manufacturing mm -hmm. mentality about it. <clears throat> now, I suppose anybody can do that, but they say that the masks help the other guy, they don't necessarily help you, the fellow who's wearing the mask. Is it still worthwhile, you know, finding a mask, making a mask? Mm -hmm. Well, I, so I've considered making my own mask. I can't sew worth a darn, but I'm thinking about tearing, cutting up old t-shirts <laughs> and doubling them up and making bandanas out of them. Um, the, the, the value of the mask is it promotes awareness. It may slow transmission. If you happen to be infected, it may slow transmission to other people. And you may not know you're infected because you may not you may be early stages not showing symptoms yet um so but it also promotes awareness you know you're and it's harder to touch your face and infect yourself if you're wearing a mask you say oh i can't touch my face and the mask reminds you of that so you, you don't want to rub your eyes because your eyes drain to your nose and then it goes down your throat and you get in your lungs um you, you, and you so you certainly want to you can help yourself by taking the precautions. The mask is helpful um, from psychological as well as some limited, some physical points of view at preventing transmission. And uh, like I say, if I could make masks, I have already made a few. Um, time for it. What about what about the ventilator thing? Um, a, a lot of people who try to weather this at home because they may not have the opportunity to go to a hospital right. well, for one yeah. reason or another, and maybe all the beds are filled right. or whatever it is. And so um, there are a lot of people going to try to tough it through, tough it through with, you know, and um, yeah. take a lot of cold medicine, symptomatic relief. Uh, mm -hmm. And and the breathing thing is of some concern. And so suppose you had a, yeah. I, I don't mean a ventilator machine, but or a respirator machine, but say a CPAP machine that helps you breathe. Would that help you, you know, breathe and not, That's a good you question. Know, not lose, lose your, yeah. I hadn't thought about CPAP machines, although they're probably going to be in short supply too. Um, mm. yeah, possibly could help. I mean, it uh, won't provide oxygen, but it will provide some positive airway pressure to help you keep your lungs inflated. Uh, the ventilators provide oxygen too, and they're having to run them pretty close to maximum oxygen or maximum pressure to save some of the people who need them. Um, but if you can reduce that with CPAP machines, maybe I'd, I'd like to see that some data on that. Um, yeah. I'm doing breathing exercises because I, I have a paralyzed left vocal cord. I'm more susceptible to pneumonia than some people are, than most people are. Um, so I'm trying to do my breathing exercise to keep my lungs clear. The important thing is to keep it from running down your throat and getting into your lungs. Because um, you know, if it's confined to your nose and mouth, and you've seen instructions on the internet like use an antiseptic mouthwash, you know, don't use a neti pot because that'll force it deeper into your tissues. Uh, there's some instructional videos about lung exercises to help you keep your lungs clear. Um, you can do those kinds of self-help, and they will. They may help some. You know, um, you want to make sure the virus, if it's in, confined to your nose and mouth, it's not probably going to be a big deal. Even you may have a fever, but it won't get into your lungs. Uh, once it gets into your lungs, that's where the problems start. Uh, so, like I said, how, how does that work? Your lungs are so damaged you can't breathe anymore, and then fluid builds up, and and you wind up suffocating. Is that what happens? Yeah. Yeah, well, your, your immune system uh, sort of works for you and against you there. Your immune system responds um, to an infection by sending these uh, neutrophils in and other immune cells too. But the neutrophils 
make a protein, an elastase protein, an, an enzyme, an elastase enzyme. What that enzyme does is it cuts the chemical bonds that the proteins that bacteria and viruses use to latch onto your cells. So the neutrophil elastase tries to protect you from the infection. The problem is in your lungs, the neutrophil elastase also cuts the bonds that hold your lung cells together. So now your lung cells are being pulled apart by the very defense mechanism your body was trying to use to protect you from the infection. And so now your liver makes an enzyme called a neutrophil that counters the neutrophil elastase, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin and some other. So that antitrypsin counteracts the effects in your lung cells of the elastase. Not everybody makes the same amount. So some people, and we don't necessarily know who in advance, um, are more susceptible to damage from their own immune system than others. And so I'm not sure the epidemiology here, how that's working with this particular virus, but then you end up with lung scarring, then you end up with COPD, um, inflicted on you by as much by your own immune system as by the uh, virus. Um, so you, some people are just more vulnerable. Um, and that's a lifelong and, problem. If you wind up walking out of it with COPD, that's going to shorten your yeah yeah hurt your lungs permanently. Yeah yeah yeah. You'll have well, permanent lung damage. Is, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I'm I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's it's complicated. Everybody has to make his own mm -hmm. his own thing on this in terms of uh, dealing with those factors, um, yeah. delaying the onset, if you will. Um, and if and, necessary, uh, you're taking the right steps. And one question I had, you talk about, everybody talks about, don't touch your face. Um, yeah. If I, if I but, but you know, it's hard not to touch your face in the ordinary oh, course. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, and let's assume you have, you have virus particles on your hand and you mm -hmm. touch your cheek. I'm not doing it. I'm just pointing. <laughs> uh, my, cheek, <laughs> no. my, my cheek is not an entryway to the eye or the mouth, or the nose. I don't know if the ear counts the same way. Maybe the yeah. ear also leads to the sinus. I don't know if that's... Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. if I touch my cheek, these, these little buggies, do they have the opportunity to actually crawl up my cheek or crawl down my cheek and, and get into a yeah. more vulnerable yeah. spot? Or, or is that really yeah. a not concern? Yeah, well, if you find a contaminate all your face and then you lick your lips, yeah, you might then end up... So the point is, they really keep it, keep getting your nose, keep getting your eyes, keep getting your mouth. Um, I, t now, I'm not an expert on this virus. I don't know how, if it can actually crawl through, but if it's on, once it's on your face, there's a better chance it'll get into your mouth or into your nose mm -hmm. or into your eyes. So, yeah, so really, don't pick your nose, don't bite your nails, don't rub your eyes, keep your hands away from all those vulnerable spots that have mucous membranes that you know, then would connect to the rest of your internal mucous membranes. How about so, washing your face? You wash your hands. Why not wash your face? Yeah. Sure. Why not wash your face? Well, yeah. I mean, it seems the soap will kill the virus. The, the, the evidence is that this COVID-19 virus falls apart when it's exposed to soap or detergent. So that's a good strategy. You know, wash your hands, then wash your face. Um, and you've got to be an expert on your own body, your own health. You've got to really understand if you have had pneumonia in the past, you know you're susceptible to pneumonia, you have to be extra vigilant. vigilant. Um, if you are intimate with somebody, you live with somebody who is susceptible to pneumonia from your past experience, be extra vigilant. Um, you really got to understand your own body as much as you can and uh, then take the precautions. I can say, hand, wash your hands, then wash your face. Like I have to put eye drops in because I just had cataract surgery. I have to put eye drops in four times a day. Wash my hands thoroughly, then put in the eye drops. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting because we, you know the the community around us is under great stress. Uh, the yeah. economy obviously is under great stress. But um, I think what I hear from you know, if you want to save yourself, you have to pay attention to your own health first, and yeah. that's what yeah. really. Yeah in terms of survival yeah. yeah the health of you and the people you live with you've got to pay attention to both of that because if your well, spouse that's very, or kids yeah. Yeah. that's a very complicated issue there was an article in the times i think was it yesterday <laughs> uh about uh, uh, somebody who uh, was taking care of uh, her husband uh who was in the same house or apartment mm -hmm. and uh yeah. they they had to divide the place up geographically so she didn't right. run across him too much 
And the idea was that uh, she should avoid being infected by him. But at the same time, the practicality, they had to live together uh, for, mm -hmm. for his benefit to stay alive. And, and the whole thing sounded very convoluted. Like a, it was it was care. Like care is always a burden. It was care at an you know an exponential level, uh, twenty four by seven to make sure that he's taken care of and you don't catch it. Hard to right. do. Yeah, and there's yeah, a lot of people sure. in the caregiver position. There's already people in the caregiver position because their loved ones have Alzheimer's or. Uh, kidney disease or something chronic, you know, heart disease, something that keeps them uh, from doing things for themselves. And this just will amplify those numbers of cases. And we'll see more divorces because of it. I mean, if you um, oh, thought of that. stress on the marriage, if you have to stay apart for an extended period of time, um, or if you want care from your spouse and if you see it because they're afraid to get the disease, then that's, that's a big stressor. Um, and there, there have been cases like that. Um, uh, hopefully this disease, you know, isn't going to lead to a lot of that, but it will lead to some of it. Um, yeah. So people, wow. yeah, well, you have to be aware of what's going on with your loved ones because you don't want to add more stress to the relationships than you have to. Um, but you have to face the reality of it. And we have yeah. to learn yep. about it. We have to, I, the way I see it is think tech has had more than 50 shows on the subject in one aspect or another. Yours is a great contribution. I hope we can come back and talk to you some more as the, as the line sure. goes up the, the hill that way. And, well, I'm going to keep tracking a little things. Yeah. I'm going to keep putting those little boxes on the chart and I hope to see it start to bend over soon. I guess we, we have, we don't have a year. We don't have months. We have six weeks to get this under control to um, give our healthcare providers a chance to save the rest of us. So we got about easy to say, to Mike. Easy to say, but uh, some of the parts of control that, that we've talked about are simply not available uh, to the healthcare system uh, and the state. Uh, they're probably not going to, sorry to say, they're probably not going to come in six weeks. You think we'll be well, well out of fit for extra beds or ventilators within six weeks? I, I kind of doubt it. Uh, uh, I think we'll be out of those. Before. Yeah. yeah, I don't feel good about it. Um, I, like I say, try to stay healthy as long as I can. So it's, and I've actually thought about, should I go out and try to get the disease now while there's still ventilators? I don't think that's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, why don't we leave it there? There's, there's some dark humor in there. Mike DeWert, right. our chief scientist here at Think Tech, helping us right. understand where this, where this scourge yeah. is taking us. Thank I you wish so I could much, bring Mike. better news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Aloha.